StartupRad.io, your podcast and YouTube blog covering the German startup scene with news, interviews, and live events. Hello and welcome everybody. This is Joe from StartupRad.io, your startup podcast and YouTube blog from Germany, as well as the world's first 24-7 internet radio station dedicated to tech companies and startups. If you have not checked it out yet, go to your favorite internet radio directory and have a look. And also in the future, there will be a skill for your Alexa. I do have in a media partnership with Hamburg Startups, Alex here, who is, as you can already guess, the founder of a startup. Hey, Alex, how you doing? Hi, Joe. I'm doing very well today. Thank you. Great to have you here as a guest, and I would suggest we jump right in. You are an American setting up a startup company in Germany. How did you end up in Germany and specifically in Hamburg? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I would start with the fact that I started learning the German language in the eighth grade through my, my school. And I always got a, I was always very interested in the German language because of the way it's constructed, all the rules and grammar. Uh, I'm an engineer, so this appeals to me very much so. Um, and I, I was always interested in the culture. And in my bachelor's studies, I came to Essen uh, for a study abroad program in the summer of 2011, doing an automotive uh, engineering inter uh, internship and, uh, you know, traveling all around Germany, seeing the different automotive sites and sort of thought it'd be nice to come back and, and maybe do a master's degree here someday and challenge myself on that. Uh, eventually, I did come back to get a master's degree in Germany, and that's how I ended up in Hamburg. I found a program at the university, Technical University of Hamburg, which combined both uh, engineering, uh, master's of science in engineering, as well as an MBA uh, for technology management. And, and that's how I ended up here in Hamburg doing that dual degree program. And that's coincidentally also how the startup came to be. Mm, I see. And when I go a little bit through your CV, you've been sticking more to the technical side, like mechanical development, operation support engineer. Uh, but but you also uh, had a little uh, had a little stint at PR and marketing. How did that happen, and uh, did it actually help you with building up the startup? Yes, uh, I'd say every step of my my journey so far has been helpful and interesting. Um, I will just go back be between my bachelor's degree, um, which I got in the United States uh, in 2013. And when I started my master's here in Germany in 2016, uh, between that time, I worked as a, as a mechanical engineer in a large corporation, automotive corporation. So I saw sort of how, you know, the big companies take a product to market uh, from the engineering side. And then when I came to get my, my MBA, I sort of started to learn the language and the lingo of the corporate world. Um, and, you know, as an engineer, sometimes you underestimate the power of PR or marketing. And um, that's something definitely I was guilty of when I when I first came. But uh, working that PR job sort of helped me see the, you know, the magic behind it and the importance of PR and marketing to a business. And that was a really good experience and really got me out of my usual um, skill set. Uh, and I learned quite a bit during that time. Did you deal with like general PR, like uh, twisting interviews, setting up uh, venues, getting contact to um, journalists, or did you work with like the more technical part of marketing, like optimizing websites, Google AdWords, um, advertisement, like performance marketing, stuff like that? Yeah, it's a lot more on the, on the back end, I would say, um, working to optimize the message uh, specifically. Uh, due to my, my language uh, skills in, in, in being a native English speaker, I, I helped revamp the website uh, on the English side to, to improve it. But I also spent a lot of time making different marketing videos um, and, and producing that sort of stuff on, on the back end. And of course, seeing the results of it on, on the front end, but being less sort of involved on, on the customer facing side. 
Well, that, uh, that's not uh, that's not too big of a disadvantage because I do believe, especially in the technical marketing like AdWords, uh, search engine optimization, and stuff like this, um, you, it always pays off to be very deep in the technical details at least in the first stage, so you get to understand what is actually going on there. And how did you make the jump? to start um, a tech company. Uh, wh what was kind of like the trigger, the trigger moment, the trigger event um, recently in the last few months? Uh, all those trigger events appeared to involve wine here on Startup Radio and <laughs> did it for you too? Um, not quite, maybe. So <laughs> It um, was beer, right? <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> um, so through my through my I met my for my one business partner um, through the MBA program. He was also studying uh, that that program, and through, as a result of the thesis, you had to find sort of a, a business idea that you could approach in a technical way because we're all engineers as well. And he brought he brought the the, the you know the pain point and, and the idea, and and I brought sort of the high level overview on the technical side. But the, the breakthrough came for us when um, I found a pitch competition that I thought we should enter. And this was back in 2017 um, in Hamburg. There used to be this competition called the Uni Pitch Competition. And it was more about like, how well you could pitch uh, rather than the business idea itself. So, you know, we were interested in, in, in pushing ourselves and, and really training our pitch skills. Um, and we entered that competition and we got into the finals, which was, I think, our big trigger point because that put us in front of uh, two or three hundred people in a room uh, back when you could do that sort of thing. And uh, it really gave us the exposure and people came up and started talking to us afterwards. And that's sort of what got the ball rolling that took it from something that was more of a student project to something that could be more serious. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you're in Hamburg, so that usually is associated in Germany more with, with like um, high high sea ocean shipping, uh, like like the big container freight um, shipping. They also have the biggest harbor for that inside of Germany. Um, but you ended up doing something in aviation. Was it that? Already as a kid, you've been interested in planes. <laughs> of course, yeah. Um, as I, I, I guess I'm a bit of an, an av an av geek myself, um, and and as an engineer, it's it's one of the more fascinating industries to to just think about from you know physics and, and engineering and materials side. So it's something that's that's always been very interesting to me, and you know Hamburg has a great. Uh, great aviation network as well. I don't know if that's widely known that it's the third biggest aviation hub behind Seattle and Toulouse, France. Um, so, you know, there's some pretty big companies located here and that's part of the reason we decided to stay around in Hamburg because the ecosystem was uh, so strong here with aviation as well. It, just to be clear, they do have aviation industry, meaning lots of um, like plane actual building they have big a big a factory for airbus uh there as well as all the nitty-gritty parts and details you would need around that um but in terms of like air traffic especially like passengers or freight hamburg is not that big it's it's big but it's like not in the top three globally <laughs> Just to make sure of that, and yeah. basically you ended up there. You always like planes, and how did you come up with the with the actual idea, like a collision warning? So this came from the the pain point itself. Uh, my business partner Andrew um, was aware of this competition that the FAA would have each year in, in the states, and they would bring various pain points to the table to say, you know, this is this is a problem that the industry is dealing with. Um, they basically put out a call to see, you know, how, how people can solve it. And this pain point of uh, colliding aircraft with, with hangars or with other aircraft while they're being moved or towed on the ground was one of the pain points, I believe, back in 2017. And so he saw that and, and um, we sort of looked at it like that sort of is sort of a silly thing that you have these, you know, $300 million aircraft sometimes that 
that you somehow just bump into a building and you know we, we, the automotive industry has solved this problem already there's little parking systems that beep at you so uh why can't you know why can't the aviation industry have something similar and, and that's sort of how we came about the the pain point let us put this a little bit into perspective um if i find some open source material i'll show some pictures but basically the issue is like there's not somebody sitting in the pilot uh, seat and is hitting a wall with the plane but actually they're very powerful very flat vehicles that are actually pulling like like the big jet planes and if you're sitting in such a small but very powerful uh, vehicle uh, you're not always aware of the dimensions like the height or the wingspan of the actual plane and i do believe that that that's where the problem comes in right exactly yeah it's very difficult from that perspective to keep track of all the surfaces as well as doing the job of moving the aircraft itself and um so yeah they just have sort of limited visibility uh, they, they usually have a team of, of workers that try to help them, you know, see around the entire aircraft. But anything that's human air based, of course, has situations um, where, where, you know, people make mistakes. And, you know, this is sort of what our, our project is trying to address is the human error in this process. And, and how could you bring a tool that uh, at least brings some sort of, um, you know, assistant to to the person moving the, the, the aircraft in the tug? Um, be before we get into system, do you have some numbers like on average how much it costs to repair such a damage? For example, when a wingtip uh, hits a wall or um, like the, oh, how, how do you call this? The back fin of the plane hits the wall? Right. Or a door? Yes, this is um, the direct costs associated with doing repairs um, on aircraft usually... Uh, run you at least 250,000 euro, but the that's just the direct cost. So you know if you can imagine that it, that plane was expected to fly the next day and they had to cancel the flight or they had to get another machine to do the job or uh, there's a lot of revenue loss potentially. There's there's a lot of indirect costs. So you can imagine that that total gets very high very fast. And we found actually statistically this is something that happens one to two times a month uh, in operations and. Um, you know, there's many thousands of movements going on every day. Um, just one airline could do, for example, 14,000 movements in a year just on maintenance alone. So there's a lot of moves going on in the background uh, that you don't necessarily see as a, as a passenger. Okay, and so now let's imagine you are, by the way, I would love to do this, sitting in this very powerful vehicle and you're towing something like a a380 airbus uh how would your system like from the perspective of a driver now help this driver not to clip uh, a wall or a corner or something like this or another uh, even worst case another plane who's standing there and waiting right so the system uh, that we're using is based on um lidar technology and it's, so it's, it's constantly scanning the environment, uh, looking for what is out there. And if something enters the, the basically the collision risk zone, then that information is communicated back to the driver sitting in the tug. And this can be done a number of ways, but one way we have currently set up is it sort of gives you a bird's eye view of the aircraft. And when an object enters a certain zone, then the warning shows up on this bird's eye view showing you where it is. So that you can, you know, stop and look and see what the potential collision is, um, and, and get a better understanding of your surroundings in a real time. Uh, in, in real time. Your company is called Evitado. How far are you guys with your current tool with the current solution? Yes. Um, actually, just a quick note: we were formerly called Flugilo. And that's what we had done a good deal of our pre-founding work underneath that name. <laughs> you, you, you guys don't do the easy names, no. right? <laughs> it's, uh, as, it's Esperanto for wing. Flugilo is Esperanto for wing. So we we're trying to find something along like wing protectors or you know wing watchers. Um, but we found that that name is not necessarily internationally compatible. Uh, it's good for Germans because flug is uh, you know a German sort of word, but 
uh, outside of German market. Uh, people had a hard time with it. So we changed it to Evitado, which is sort of the root for uh, avoidance. So we have collision avoidance technologies is the idea of the name. Um, so currently, uh, we founded the company in, in July of 2019. We had done some work uh, with the Airbus BizLab Accelerator, really understanding the pain point, watching them move aircraft for, for about two weeks in their facilities before we even put something down on paper of a first design. Uh, and we spent some time on a high level overview, you know, using LiDAR in this environment because it hadn't really been used. Uh, 3D LiDAR hadn't been used in this environment before. So we were just sort of proving that the, the data would, would give you enough information to, to see the surroundings properly. Um, we currently have a, um, you know, a very high functioning prototype that we can bring to customers to do demonstrations that we will give over for a couple months at a time to do trials so they can understand how the tool would fit in their operations. Um, we're sort of in the product market fit stage, just really validating that and, and validating the, the value addition to the, the customer that we, we think our tool provides. And we're also consequently raising a, a seed funding round to finish this product market fit stage that we currently find ourselves in. Um, I I have multiple questions on that. But first, uh, when you said you've been with Airbus and watching several weeks, how they actually move those big to extremely big planes, I had like instantly the picture in my head you sitting in a camping chair one hand bag of chips the other hand a can of uh, some soda and watching planes was that the case more or less yeah they took us around i mean it was a great experience because we got to go with the the end users of our tool eventual tool and really understand from their point of view what their job was like what the requirements are both from a hard perspective of like what is the maximum weight of the product to a soft perspective of, you know, how, how would it actually make their lives better? Um, because in a, you know, in a B2B business, of course, you're, you're saving your end users money or time. That's the given, but you have to also offer them, you know, peace of mind or you have to make their lives better in some way. And that's some of the soft skills we picked up uh, doing that internship. And we also were able to forge a really good relationship with the end users and, and sort of, you know, get into their persona and, and understand what their needs are. It's a really great experience. Oh, yeah, 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 I think so. Uh, I would just go there just to sit there and move the, and look the planes moving with the soda and a bag of chips. But um, you, you're talking about LiDAR and your pro product. How far does it go? Is it like only the LiDAR sensors? Is it software behind it? Will it be eventually like like a monitor, like like a flat screen in the, in the, in the tow vehicle itself? Yeah, so currently the system wirelessly communicates to like a, a tablet and, and the tablet is the user interface that sits with the tug driver uh, and does that in real time. Uh, mainly what we do, although we have a hardware product or hardware system that we that we end up putting together, uh, we're actually more of a software company. So what we're, we're doing is we're working on the robotics software topics that are the same as what you find in the self-driving car industry. But we're taking these and transferring them to these industrial applications um, to move these large assets. So in a sense, you know, our first use case is moving a commercial aircraft, but the, the system can be used for really any asset that you want to move. And it's quite powerful if you think about you don't have to really wait for the industrial automation revolution because it's, it's here now. You can install our system on any asset you'd like to move, whether it's a smart asset or not. Um, so that's sort of the, the overall vision of, of our company. Uh, and more why we see ourselves as a software provider than, than the hardware uh, provider. Okay, before I get in like my last question, there was one in between because when you're talking about uh, what you guys are actually doing, that you're providing it on a tablet, uh, the, the, the final output, I was thinking there are many companies out there who do some very sophisticated um Uh, flight simulators. Have you ever given consideration to do this actually as a simulator, as as a like more or less realistic game as well? Oh, we would love to uh, add our tool to the Microsoft Flight Simulator, for example, because uh, that that is a beautiful. I don't know if you've seen that. Maybe the, the Av geeks in your community might might play Microsoft Flight Simulator, the most recent one they've released. Um, but it's beautiful. It's so well done. Uh, the graphics are so realistic, and the operations are so real. 
Um, so yeah, we, we've we've been trying to reach out and get our tool on to simulators like that. And we do use on, on the back end in our own uh, you know development process, we use a lot of simulations as well. So it's definitely something we could we could get into. Admittedly, I do have a relative who is a licensed pilot, so he uh, flies around tourists in the usual uh, regular scheduled flights to like North Africa and Eastern Europe and uh, parts of the Middle East. So he's a full pilot and he also has all the gear uh, you would need for the flight simulator at home. So I know a few people who really are into this stuff and actually they're professionals doing that. Um, The last question, you were, you've been talking about a seed round. Um, how much are you looking at, like in terms of raising total money, and when will it? When are you looking to close it? I assume um, coro the current situation with Corona kind of extended your time horizon when you when you're looking to close this round. Yes, uh, the the COVID situation has been quite interesting for us. It's given us a first a first hand uh, lesson on, on how to manage a little crisis. Um, obviously, the the commercial aerospace industry was pretty well impacted by this uh, the pandemic, and that's challenged uh, you know the validation of the business model, um, especially last year. What we have been seeing this year is that uh, the, the market is picking up again, and a lot of interest has come back to the table. Um, it's not. The market argumentation is not so critical for us right now because, you know, we don't need the whole market to pick up. We just need one or two initial, you know, paying customers to say yes and to try all our product and to use it in our operations. So I think by the time it's, it's we're ready to scale and, and enter the market in force that the commercial aviation market will pick up um, for us in, in a good way. And, and I'm hoping the baby boomers all get vaccinated and, and restart the, the travel industry, uh, as I'm sure many people in the aviation industry are hoping um for, for for me personal uh personally it's it I, i'm not a rock plug in that i would love to travel again basically since corona my uh my uh horizon has been limited to my apartment since i'm working from home getting around like grocery shopping and drive to my mother's place that's about it no more um and uh but but i totally uh see that it makes sense your business your tool and also when you survived corona it shows the validity of the team as well as the approach to external investors and everybody who would like to learn more they can go down here in the show notes and reach out to you directly via the company website or your linkedin profile yeah that's right um that was one of the biggest lessons for us this year is the team you know sticking together through a crisis uh helping each other out and we you know we were really happy with the team we, we've built up and, and we're looking forward to continuing this project um you know we've also taken the time to look into other industries and, and to reach out to other pain points um but you know through the continued support of our partners in the aerospace industry we've sort of stuck with it and we think it'll turn around pretty pretty soon here for us um that being said just to answer your questions about the seed round We are looking for 750,000 euro. We think this will give us around 18 months of runway time to finish this uh, product market fit and get, ga gather as much interest on the market and also allow the market to recover a little bit uh, to be ready to raise a larger round to, to do the scaling and entry to market um, in force. And we'd like to close this round by, you know, basically the end of, end of quarter two uh, would be ideal for us. And yeah, we're very happy to, to, to talk to, to any investors or anyone out there who's interested in learning more about our, our project. Um, we're a very approachable group. Just out of your gut feeling, when do you guess or estimate that commercial aviation will be back at pre-corona levels. We shared uh, just a few weeks back the interview with uh, the executive of a travel tech startup, and he said 2024, it will be back to pre-corona levels. Do you also have like such a dark outlook on the aviation industry, or do you think like 2022, it will all be back to normal and we see a new boom? Yeah, that's a tricky question. Um... <laughs> you know, 2019 was pretty much the best, one of the best years in aviation, uh, commercial aviation history. So, you know, that's that's a tough, uh, that's a high bar to reach. 
when we reach that level again, I'm not sure. Um, specifically for, for our project, actually air traffic and, and the number of movements don't correlate one to one. So um, we have a little bit of protection from, from the market in that way. I would say based on my, my estimate, I think the, the market would recover, you know, a decent amount by, by mid 2023. And I, I think as soon as, as soon as it's able to recover, people will be out there and, and airlines will be pushing hard. And I think things will bounce back relatively quickly once, once things become safe to do so. I think everyone's sort of itching to, to travel or to, to go places or to do, to do business. And, and I think that the air, air traffic will recover really quickly. Thank you very much for being an interview guest here. Thank you very much for the insights and looking forward to have you back in some time. Yeah, thank you very much for having me today. I appreciate it. That's all, folks. You find welcome. more news, thank you. streams, Bye -bye. events, Bye. and interviews at www.startuprad.io. Remember, sharing is caring.